that everybody has opportunities for authentic human relationships, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, student to teacher, student to community, and that they're ready for the future. If we do those things well, each student will ascend. And, and they'll be prepared for life. And notice what we say prepared for life is. Each graduate, if I don't know how well you can read that, will be connected to knowledge and skills, service, connected to people, <clears throat> the world, and the future. So that's what we mean by prepared for life. And it really, we can boil this down to how we want our students to learn. So I'm going to focus in on three things. What we're calling uh, now learner positioning system. And I'll spend most of my time on that. A healthy community, which we've been talking about all year, and progressive learning uh, spaces. We've been talking about really this concept of a learner positioning system. We've been talking about it uh, for at least three years, and we were really referring to it originally. We talked about blended learning as 360 transparency and learning. In other words, to take the mystery out of learning, to take the mystery out of the process, and, and that remains uh, the goal. So we all know what a GPS is. We all know that there are hundreds of satellites, of course, revolving around the world, or thousands, but hundreds or so of GPS, and they can tell us exactly, uh, even in the most difficult New Jersey roads, they can tell us exactly uh, how to get from point A to point B, and give us options, and tell us all sorts of information, even at the right street level. Uh, so you get that type of thing, of course, today with the GPS, and it's pretty simple concept is to know where you are, where you are going, and how you're going to get there. And we talk about a learner positioning system for students, same concept. Where are you? Where are you going? How can you get there? And of course, uh, everything from kindergarten to graduation, that can be pretty complex, right? You think everything that a, uh, a six-year-old is going to go through on the process to becoming 18, all the different trials and tribulations where they have to pick themselves up and demonstrate resilience. Uh, there, there's quite a bit there, right? So a learner positioning system is really the same thing. It's going to help students know where, where they are, how, where they need to go, and how to get there. And take that mystery out of learning. And of course, our goal is not just to graduate, uh, but to really launch uh, students into life um, so that they're prepared for the whole arc of life. If you think about education, it used to be Right, that industrial approach to education, put all that knowledge in uh, someone's brain and, and uh, let them loose in 1957, and they work for 30 years and retire. Well, now, of course, things are much different uh, today. And uh, when they look at all this, the, the different educational, uh, I'm sorry, medical things, that is revolution that's taking place in the world, student, these students in an ideal circumstance, they're going to live to 95, 100, and, and beyond. So think about what does that mean for our education? What does that mean for our system today? We don't want merely to teach them to s the standards. We want to make sure that our students master learning process itself and to learn how to live. That's part of it. So what are the steps? Those are lofty words and lofty things that we're talking about. How do we actually operationalize that? And there's really six different steps or five uh, that, that we see and that we're planning on. And the first one there, if you can see it, critical actions uh, 1.0, uh, standards-based learning. So I, I do just want to pause there a little bit and, and make sure we understand why standards and standards-based learning is critical. So here's a writing standard for third grade. You can see 3.1. And you can see if the students are supposed to master the standard, again, is what students have to master, to write opinions, write opinion pieces on topics or texts, right? Supporting a point of view with reasons. And then by sixth grade, that turns into write arguments to support with clear reasons and relevant evidence. And in fact, uh, you can work that all the way up to AP, and this is right from the AP website, to analyze different types of arguments, ex examine different structures, structures of argument and of writing, and examine the appropriateness of evidence and so on and so forth. And that's the importance of standards, right? Right from kindergarten all the way uh, to graduation. And the SATs, by the way, today are aligned to the standards. All the way through, um, it builds on each other. And that's why standards is so important. When you look at the New Jersey Learning Standards, there's a, a phrase in there 
that students must grapple with works of exceptional craft and thought whose range extends across genres, cultures, and centuries. So I'm a parent. I have a 14-year-old and a soon-to-be 17-year-old. And I want my student, my child, to be a deep thinker. I want him to be able to grapple with the great works of literature and understand uh, humanities through a really uh, uh, a lens of a thinker, right? Well, the purpose for the standards is that just doesn't happen at AP. That's got to be starting at first grade, second grade, third grade. There's got to be a plan all the way through. And that's why the standards are so important. And there's a certain architecture that's worked for thousands of years, right, when it comes to uh, simple things. And that's true with learning as well, if you excuse the metaphor. There are certain things that need to be in place that we know work. Uh, and, and the research shows. And so everything should be anchored in learning standards. In your written curriculum, your instructional strategies, the technology platforms you use, your professional development, the resources, the supervision and evaluation, the assessments, everything should align to those learning standards. And when you do that, when your system aligns everything perfectly, you have learning at a high level. And, and that is really one of our core uh, jobs, is to make sure all those pieces align. And, and when that happens, again, learning takes place. We usually refer to that as the curriculum process or the instructional core. But that's really the first step, standards-based learning. And it's not just, by the way, reading and writing. That's math, science, phys ed, art, all the different disciplines. The second step to this is what we call interoperability, data and and again, if everything's aligned, then what we want to do is make sure that all the different types of data that has to do with the standards is coming in to a certain spot. So data in before you can get it out. And there's just, just tons of data, thousands of data points that we have with students now. And uh, for, for example, we know uh, with the kids um, through Clever, all the different uh, online platforms that we have, we can see their usage, like News ELA, and uh, how they're using it, how, what the, the scores are on the quizzes and grades. With Canvas, we have analytics, again, and the different types of learning that's taking place, all the assessments. Here's another example, vocabularycity.com, and we see what the kids are getting right, what they're getting wrong, we see the patterns of their learning. All this data, whether it's part, I ready, uh, Albert I.O., which is, uh, helps uh, students with uh, AP and SAT, and we have dashboards that show the risk. We have all this data on and on and on, and it's about getting it in in an organized way. So we've been working for the last three years on doing just that, organizing all these different data platforms to get it into our system. And in fact, when we when we purchase and use a digital system, we just don't use what we like. Oh, that looks pretty cool, let's use it. We don't do that at all. There's a system choosing digital platforms. You can see the first thing in that system has to be aligned to district curriculum, that we own the data, it's compatible with our uh, learning management system, and, and uh, student privacy is always a concern. So this is a slide that I showed last year about uh, we're creating this district vision for organizing our data. And I showed this slide last year as well, about getting the data in. And we continue. The Morris School District really is widely viewed as a leader uh, in interoperability and working on this issue. We held a summit this year here, uh, bringing in our providers and other schools were part of that. And in fact, uh, we're part of one of 93 schools that's part of the League of Innovative Schools recognized by this organization as one of the most innovative school districts in the nation. Um, and, that's, and mostly, I, I would say, because of our leadership on this issue. And can you, can you find a more school district there? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Jump off the page. So data in, interoperability, critical actions, 2.0. So standard-based learning, now we want to make sure that we have the habits of looking at data. If your data looks like that, it's in a spreadsheet, well, it's, uh, it's pretty useless, actually. The data has got to, it's got to be um, where it helps teachers. And, and it helps teachers 
help students. It's got to get to the teacher's hand. Not that the teacher's going to sit home and look at 40 pages of spreadsheets, but in a digestible, usable way. So the teacher can do what the teacher does best, which is form that strong human relationship, that partnership with the kids, meeting their needs. And so we continue, whether it's iReady, in our elementary schools, showing the next steps for instruction, showing how we can uh, create groups of kids with similar strengths and weaknesses, or we take the, the data that we have ourselves and we're seeing from our own internal benchmarks or park or whatever the, the data coming in, where it's showing us we should focus our attention. And here's a good example from Hillcrest, one of our schools, where, uh, of course, I deleted the students' names, but you can see we keep the data from iReady, the DRA, and for each student in that school, the teachers are going in and they're writing goals for those students when it comes to math, reading and writing. So we're, pers we're using the data to personalize the instruction. And at Freeling Heisen, they've been working on making sure, along with keeping that data, that they're connecting every student to uh, extracurricular, co-curricular activity. So again, using the data to make sure we're connecting with the kids. Make sure that the students are connected to the school, that the instruction is meeting their needs. So the data has got to can't just exist on its own in some kind of spreadsheet, but we've got to form habits and practices to make sure that it's useful. So our fourth step in a learner positioning system is now critical actions three, which is the whole child. And uh, this is the interesting step. I'd say over the last 10 years in the state and in the nation, if you look at this, this is kind of my interpretation of how much time has been spent on standards and how much time has been spent on social, emotional learning and community. And rightly so, from one perspective, there was definitely a need uh, throughout the nation to make sure that we had high standards for our students and clear, consistent standards. But uh, as we move forward, the research has become more and more and more compelling over the last 10 years that, <coughs> excuse me, that Self-control, effort, perseverance are greater predictor of success in high school and college than IQ. Grit, the ability to manage your time, the ability to get along with others, respond, learn from your mistakes, and study after study after study. And if that's true, then how are we responding to that? If that's true, that the, the, the growth of social-emotional learning is more powerful than some of these other things, then what's our response? And it needs to be, in my opinion, pretty pronounced. So a great quote from Carol Dweck, who wrote Mindset, a great book uh, for any parent to read. Measures of achievement tell you where a student is, but they don't tell you where a student can end up. And that's where we want to get to in this district, that we have a learning positioning system that tells you really with confidence where a student's going to end up. So we're going to really work here in the district defining educational goals beyond purely academic measures. And there are a lot of things out there that we're exploring where these learning metrics, you can see growth mindset and grit and effort. And this is the direction that I think you'll see, certainly not only in this school district, but uh, throughout the nation, learning analytics to social emotional learning analytics. And this is what it should look like in our district over the next three to five years. We're devoting the time and energy and attention certainly to community and social emotional learning. And we certainly are doing that in our schools, but we want to we want to ramp it up a few notches. Data out. So interoperability 2.0. So uh, there's a lot of data um, and we're getting it in. And the question is can you get it out in a useful way? And I believe that this is not just a, something that we see in school systems, but certainly this is something any organization today is about getting the data out in a useful way. So here we see, I think, is a good example. Look at this green line. This tells you where this student should be throughout the year. The black line is the predicted growth, and then the checkered line is the actual growth. And this is the kind of analytics that we should be getting in terms of when we look at all the data, reading, writing, math, attendance, behavior, grit, perseverance, connection to community, participation, inclusion, all of that should come together 
to show us, all right, to show us where a student is projected to, to grow. And again, if, if this was one of our students, we would say, all right, that, that is above the, the expected growth. A few more years like this, and this person's going to catch up. And this is what we're looking for. This is a slide I had in last year's presentation. Again, just to reemphasize, this is not something that was on the latest commercial, but something we've been working towards for the last couple of years. We're talking about data and service of learning, data on demand. So we don't have to spend hours and hours pulling it out, but having it efficient and useful so we can, uh, our teachers can use it and our, and our administrators in the most effective means. So interoperability 1.0, be all those things going into one spot, but ultimately by 2.0, what we're talking about is all these different metrics of achievement and preparation for life coming into a system that really give meaning to the education. So finally, we have all that together, we should be able to have and create a longitudinal learner profile that follows a student all the way through examples of their progress, their goals, their strengths, their weaknesses. Um, and ultimately, if we have the, the system to where it should be, we have students who know where they're at. And we have students who then can develop agency. Now by agency, what I'm talking about are students who know that when they act, there's an outcome, there's a, a fruitful outcome to their action that they can impact their own lives. They can make decisions, they can act, they can change the course of their lives. Certainly there are students who learn helplessness, and we all do in some capacity, but there are ambiguous goals. You don't know where you are. You don't know how to, where to go. You don't know how to get there. And what's going to happen is you're going to eventually develop a self-narrative that I can't do it. But if you have clear goals, and the goals are clear, and then you can then have very clear ways to get there, the development of step knowledge, then you can take action and all of the research shows that agency can be learned. This is not something that is in your DNA that you're born with. True, your life circumstances may teach you helplessness. That's very true. But it can be unlearned and relearned that you have agency and that you have control over your lives. What could be a more powerful, more powerful experience, or education is the best word for any student, when I think of my own children, that they feel like they can control their future by taking the right steps. And that only comes, by the way, through real achievement. That comes through real achievement. And so this is what we continue to work towards. It's not just for the student, but certainly for the parents, that you always know where your child is struggling. You know what your child's signature strengths are. This goes way beyond a report card. You know if your child's on track. So this is our direction. And so in conclusion to this topic, we're not talking about mastery just of one thing. We're talking about mastery of the learning process, mastery of living. And this is the goal of our school system. And so if we create that system, at the center of it should be our students are more connected. What my child, my, my soon-to-be 17-year-old, he'll say, TBU. Anybody know what TBU is? True but useless. All right? That's a 17-year-old. All right? So if you have a system, but it's not strengthening the relationships, and if it's not growing a person's social-emotional, that's why I don't like that word, system. It takes that personal out of it. But the system that you create does strengthen and empower those human relationships, and it'll be a system where all teachers, all parents, all administrators see the child as learner and as a human and not merely just as this student who learns A plus B will C. And that's the more school district's goal. We have been working on this for certainly three years and more. We are well on our way through the first three steps and moving uh, aggressively in the next three years on the next couple. So we feel very confident about where we're at at this point. At this point, We know exactly where we want to go in our next steps. And it's certainly very exciting for many of us. Let's talk about a healthy community. Well, how do we want our students to learn? We want them to know what the goals are. We want them to know how to get there. We want to support them along the way. The other way that we want, how do we want our students to learn? We want them to be part of a healthy community. Um, 
And so we first started talking about this in Tom Friedman's uh, last book, Thank You for Being Late. He talks about the critical need for healthy communities. And again, when we talk about students being prepared for life, there's no way, in my opinion, they can be prepared for life, truly, unless they're coming from a healthy community. And so we've really been working on a coherent vision for what that means. And we've been working across all these different areas this year, and we certainly will continue and beyond, taking a lot of action on student wellness practices, having trainings and workshops and a lot of dialogue about anxiety and depression and the impact of social media on students' health and wellness. We've been working hard with equity, access, and inclusion and developing intercultural mindset and competencies in the district, creating what I think is a pretty dynamic plan moving forward so that we have a system, a framework of learning, of professional learning and development where this becomes the core thing that we are about uh, when you enter this district. And then, of course, uh, safety and security has, has been on everyone's mind. And we had a forum not too long ago, April 10th, and this presentation is online. I'll just mention a few things because it's related uh, to our budget uh, that's on the agenda tonight. We did hire uh, Rich Ferrone this year as district manager of safety and operations. Rich has 26 years of experience, uh, a captain in the Morris uh, Township Police Force. And I think this is one of the most significant things that we've done this year. We have someone whose job every single day is to look at our practices, look at our policies, look at our buildings, look at our habits, and is focused on improving the school system safety and security. And so there's a lot that we're doing for infrastructure. There's a lot that we're doing in all of our buildings. All of our buildings have panic buttons. All of our buildings are getting, some already have, um, uh, bullet resistant, bulletproof and bullet resistant laminate on uh, windows. All of our buildings uh, are uh, we're enhancing our cameras, kiosks, uh, vestibules in the front of each school. So we're taking a lot of steps for our infrastructure throughout the district and all of our buildings. And we've made room in our budget for class three police officers in all of our schools. So we have 10 schools. In all of our schools, we'll have a class three officer. A class three officer is a retired police officer, works for the police force to serve in the function of working in schools, providing safety and security for schools. Their focus is safety and security. Uh, student discipline is not part of that equation. And uh, these are people who, again, have experience. They're working for the police force. They're armed and uniformed and will be in all of our schools, and some will be arriving soon. Uh, by the way, we have SROs at Freeling Heisen and the high school already. We've had police officers in our school systems for over a decade. We've worked hard to establish healthy and strong relationships with our police force, and they've been a real added uh, plus in all of our schools, uh, Freeling Heisen and high school. So the goal is healthy, happy schools, all right? Uh, we talk a lot about numbers, and we'll get to some of that in a second. Um, but certainly uh, relationships and, uh, and connecting with each other is a big part of what we do. How do we want our students to learn? Well, we want them to learn in dynamic, inspiring facilities and places. Uh, you know, the Morristown School District, Morristown High School, um, this comes from uh, the yearbook, 1918 yearbook. Uh, the, the original Morristown High School is considered one of the great uh, progressive buildings for its time. People came from all over to go to school here. Um, and as you know, and we're sitting in the new 2016, uh, we continue to build and uh, great spaces that we uh, uh, built here three years ago, uh, progressive downstairs, uh, tremendous equipment, technology integration, classrooms. Uh, we've worked hard at the high school, uh, new facilities, parking lot, fencing, bleachers, all sorts of things, lighting, all sorts of things. A new home for the Morristown Colonials, great spirit here, and new bleachers, all sorts of things to upgrade what we're doing, partnering with the community for the beautification of the school. So a lot of great work. 
We've uh, refurbished the art suite. Uh, step one was last summer. Um, step two will be this summer coming up. And just a few before and after. Uh, picture, remember? Um, looks a little bit better now. Uh, of course, with art, you need a lot of places to store your stuff. And uh, we did not mess up the classroom on purpose to the left. Much cleaner. Uh, great, great uh, improvement. Our students and teachers deserve the very best. They deserve the very best facilities. And your, your spaces should be inspiring. And this summer we'll, we'll do 2.0 and finish it off. Great stuff. So we've been working super hard in the high school to, to bring it up, uh, to make it a dynamic place full of great spaces where a lot of great things can happen for, for learning uh, and for education of our children. But is, is that all throughout the entire district, all of our elementary schools in Freeling High School? So the arts and science, the point I want to make is uh, we have very much inspiring teachers, we have inspiring students, we have inspiring programs. You look at Freeling Heisen, over near, nearly 700 students at Freeling Heisen are in music program, either band, orchestra, or chorus. And they're winning all sorts of awards all the time. Uh, last year's uh, Teen Arts Festival. Uh, this is from last year's presentation. We have, I, I know there's a lot of superintendents out there praising their STEM program. I absolutely believe our STEM Academy is one of the very best in the state. Uh, it's tremendous what's happening. The program is absolutely exploding. We have new classes at Freeling Heisen. These classes are thriving. These classes uh, are becoming more and more popular. Uh, we have new uh, National Society of Black Engineers, a new, new group at Freeling Heisen, over 30 kids involved in that. Again, establishing the social capital and the human relationships. Uh, we're one of only two schools, by the way, in New Jersey with one of those chapters. We have girls who code, girls in STEM. We just had a big day up here at the high school. We had over 65 female students from Freeling Heights and involved in STEM activities here at the high school uh, for a day. So the STEM Academy continues to just uh, uh, thrive and do greater and greater things, helping our students, including one of the biggest clubs now we have at the high school, the Colonial Rocketry. And beyond that, we've got Great programs, Colonial Corner. Our kids are won the uh, best film in New Jersey last year, radio. We've got these thriving programs. That's the point. We have thriving programs, great teachers. We want to make sure that our facilities do not limit the greatness of these programs. We want to make sure throughout the district, in our elementary schools, and in our and at Freeling Heisen that we're not limited by our spaces, and that our spaces are as dynamic as our teachers. And especially in the arts, and especially in STEM, this is where kids come together and really ascend. This is where true integration takes place. This is where kids take off. And we see that time and time and time again, and this is the district we're called to be. So our next step is to make sure our facilities throughout the district are as progressive as our teaching. So let's look at the numbers. 5,200 students, 3,000 families, 925 employees, one community, and one budget. And this is a lot of work. This is a lot of work. Uh, a lot of needs. You need to be visionary. You need to be anchored in your values. You need to make tough choices to make sure you're meeting kids' needs. And it's a lot of work, and we work hard at it. So the numbers. This year our budget is 2.82% increase in the tax levy, and that's 0.82% over the 2% cap. Now we have what's called banked cap, which means if you're frugal, uh, especially when it, uh, you are allowed to go back and pull uh, from banked cap, especially when it comes to uh, that gets uh, banked because of healthcare and enrollment, and we've certainly been frugal with our budgets every year. And the reason why we're going to bank cap uh, is A, hold on, let me, this is a slide from last year's presentation. We're not cutting uh, the programs that we've been working on. We're not cutting bilingual reading and writing initiatives, 
our counseling program, facilities, our elementary class sizes will continue to remain very...